Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. So again, let yourself sit in a way that is comfortable to listen and listen with an open mind, but don't uh, try to remember this stuff. Um, <laughs> it's really, it's, there's no quiz at the end, and it's, it's much more of a reminder to something that you already know in some deep way in yourself, if it's true. And if it's not, you can just let it pass by. So last week we talked about the power and the practice of forgiveness and we did some forgiveness meditation and the trainings of letting go and opening um, that forgiveness allows for the heart and previous talks earlier this spring talked about mindfulness and the healing qualities of mindfulness Um, tonight I'd like to take a a step further um, and rather than talk about the systematic practices which are um, important and wonderful of working with breath and body and, and mindfulness and loving kindness in a systematic way, I want to talk about the fruits of meditation a bit um, because sometimes hearing about it awakens within us um, a knowing or an understanding that we already carry. And part of the fruits of meditation, of quieting the mind and transforming the heart, um, is the ability to connect with something that is timeless, that is outside of the ordinary round of our days, um, with a, a spirit that nourishes our being in a way that almost nothing else can. And it's beautiful to watch people on retreats. If some of you I know have done a week retreat or 10-day retreat and so forth, those people come in tired and haggard and exhausted and um, restless and filled with tension and so forth. And as the days go on, I mean, I see it too in classes over time, but especially it's visible because I'm with people on retreats. As the days go on, they get lighter and their faces get more open and their shoulders drop a little and you know, a little bit of a facelift, somebody said, really. Um, and there's a sense of, of, of ease and connectedness and, and, a, and a deepening openness to, to the reality of the present, to living life rather than being lost as we are so often in the competing plans and thoughts and multitasking that's, that's been asked of us. There's something really deep that happens when we let ourselves sit still and come back and listen. And I think tonight of my um, uh, dear friend Salam, who uh, was on and off as a Palestinian activist, um, was on and off imprisoned in um, Israel for writing about a free Palestine in the years when it wasn't um, legitimate legally to do so, um, and was at one point, as happens in war on all sides, was at one point beaten and tortured. Um, and uh, as he said, he died, um, or so they wrote in the police report. Um, uh, but actually he had one of those out-of-the-body experiences that many people report during accidents and other kinds of dramatic or traumatic times. Um, and what he reported to kind of keep this, this evening's version of the story short, after some remarkable experiences of that kind, he, he said, you know, they could imprison my body, but they couldn't touch my spirit. It's like Nelson Mandela walking out of Robben Island prison after 27 years with such a grand and compassionate vision of humanity with so much um, magnanimity and graciousness and and forgiveness um, 
They can imprison your body, but they can't touch your spirit. And so there's something in meditation about learning to reconnect with ourselves and quiet ourselves and be more mindful as we eat or as we attend to things. But there's also some deeper truth that awaits every human being always here, the, the, the vast silence around us and the, the spirit that's born into us. And one of the things that happens as we practice mindfulness and coming to live in the present is that there there awakens in us a shift of identity. Kalu Rinpoche, great Tibetan Lama, says, you live in illusion and the appearance of things. You're always kind of worried about all these different changing conditions of the world. There is a reality, but you do not know this. And when you understand, you will see that you are nothing. And being nothing, you are everything. That is all. So this is a pretty condensed, pithy, and serious (laughs) teaching. You are nothing, and being nothing, you are everything. That is all. It's not a philosophy. It's actually an experience, and I will talk about it because you know it in some deep way. So at one point, the Buddha was standing in the forest or the grove in um, the Jeduan Monastery, and he reached down and he picked up a handful of grass and twigs and leaves, and he said to his monks and nuns, would you call this grass and these twigs and these leaves you, yourself, I, me, mine? And they said, no, that's leaves, that's grass, that's twigs. He said, neither so, then, is the physical body who you are. That's also not I. Neither are the feelings, neither are the thoughts. Now, this becomes a little bit more complicated because we tend to think that we are our body or our feelings or our thoughts. But as you start to become mindful of the body, you notice it has its own rhythms in life. And sometimes it's painful and sometimes it's pleasant and sometimes there's tension and sometimes it's heat and cold. The elements show themselves. It's hard and soft. Um, I remember walking through the Miami airport and this happens pretty regularly to me just because I've met so many people over the years. And a guy came up to me. I was on my way to some retreat. And he says, hey, Jack, remember me? I sat the (laughs) retreat in 1978, the three-month retreat with you in Massachusetts. It was a long retreat, and I kind of remembered him. And he said, you know, I, I'm not a very good meditator. After that, I, you know, I kind of lost it and, you know, did various other things. He said, but last year I had a heart attack. And um, as I was being taken to the hospital, the emergency room, and then wheeled into surgery, and my body was in great pain, he said, I knew what to do. All that meditation training came back. I knew how to be with with what was painful. I knew how to be with my breath. I knew how to be in the space of awareness, he said. And it's so helpful to have done that, even though I thought I had failed by not continuing. So there comes a kind of wisdom of how to be with what is in the body um, in a wise and a mindful relationship to see that it's not your pain or your joy, but as you sit, it's heat and cold and it is tension and release and it's not personally your pain, it's just the pain of having a body. Anybody not have it, first of all? I just want to check in here and see. (laughs) It's the pain. It's the pain that you're born into a body. It's one of the things you have and it's part of humanity. And you go, oh yeah, it's not mine. It's just part of this human nature. Or you sit and you pay attention with mindfulness to your emotions, which change like the spring weather in the Bay Area this year. (laughs) Dazzling sun, oh, summer has come, more rains, you know. And it's what happens. You sit there and you feel happy and then you feel sad and then you feel anxious Um, And I have this list that I read sometimes of 500 different emotions and feelings, (laughs) you so forth. Um, And at first, you take them personally or you don't want a particular one and you want some other, I like these emotions and I don't like those emotions. 
Um, but that's not how it works, actually. Um, they come and go on their own. Sometimes tears, sometimes laughter, sometimes joy, sometimes anxiety. Anybody not have anxiety sometimes? <laughs> Just checking again here, okay? It's humanity, and you start to see, oh, these are the vocabulary of the river of feelings. There's a river of body experiences that we all live with. There's a river of emotions. My teacher, Ajahn Chah, said that if you haven't really wept deeply, you probably haven't meditated very much yet because there is in us an ocean of tears, of loss and grief. But there's also incredible joy to be found. All of these are a part of ourselves, and we can touch them, and they become in some way both alive to us and in another way not quite so personal. And then your thoughts. You know, it's one thing to have body sensations and another have emotions, but we actually believe our thoughts. That is nutty. It is. First of all, 95% of them are reruns, as you know, right? And not only that, they're, they're boring reruns. I mean, if somebody next to you, if you could kind of turn up the volume so the person sitting next to you heard your thoughts, they would think you were nuts. They would. They say, well, well, she or he has an obsessive compulsive disorder. We know that. But I think it's bordering on psychosis, really. I mean, look at them, you know, and then we take them to be, and, and they have so many opinions, and the mind has no pride, and it will do anything, right? So this mother who is driving her five-year-old to the preschool or kindergarten, while she, while she the mom dropped them off, while she the mom was on her way to the clinic where she worked as a as a family physician, and her daughter was sitting in the front seat, buckled in her 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 seat, and in front was her mom's doctor's bag, and the little girl opened the doctor's bag and took out the stethoscope and began to play with it, you know, and and her mother kind of looked over and felt a lot of um, joy at seeing this thing. Oh, my daughter's playing doctor. You know, not with a little boy, but anyway, okay. She's playing, she's playing doctor, and isn't this great? And maybe, you know, she will get interested in medicine. And she, so the whole vision, she'll go to medical school like I did. You know? And then the, the little girl picked up the, the um, listening end of the tethoscope to her mouth and said, welcome to McDonald's. Can I take your order, please? You know. We have all these ideas about who somebody is and what's going to happen with them. And, I mean, how often do they actually pan out? So what we start to see is that the thoughts think themselves. And they're mostly conditioned. They are. They're conditioned by the junk that you read and all the stuff that's fed to you from the media and the other stuff, you know, it's a lot of conditioned stuff. And it's not bad particularly, but it's also not necessarily very wise. So you see, all right, this is the body with its joys and sorrow. This is the body with its pains and, and pleasures and tension and, and, and so forth. These are all the weather of emotions of all the different kinds that come through. These are, this is the river of thoughts. Now, we could take them to be ourselves, but the problem is that your thoughts change. And, you know, you might have been a Democrat one year and a libertarian another, we'll say. I mean, I don't know. Or, you, you know, you've changed. You have. Or your emotions. I feel this way for a long time. And then you're, so who are you if your emotions change? Or your body. Everybody knows biochemically that... Um, all the molecules of your body change after seven years. It's not actually the same, but it's a pattern that recycles stuff through it. All right. So then maybe your role is who you are. You're a daughter. You're a son. You're a teacher. You're an engineer, a waitress, a waiter, a cook, um, a businesswoman, a performance artist, a policewoman, you know, a politician, maybe. Um, I remember going home after teaching one of these classes when my daughter was somewhat younger. She was 13 or 14. And 
there was a lot going on in our house, and I forget, <clears throat> but it was kind of stressful. We were dealing, I don't know, maybe it was when we were re, refixing, re, redoing part of the house or something. And I remember my dad or look, daughter looking at me and she said, Dad, I think you just need to go meditate, you know, chill out. And it's like, <laughs> thank you. Because the thing is that if you go home as a policewoman or a policeman and you think that's who you are, you'll be a terrible parent because that's the role you have at work. You know, or if you think you're the doctor, you're not the doctor to your children. You're their mother or you're their father. Um, or if you come back from the office, wherever it happens to be, or your place of work, to your partner or your lover, you know, and you're in that role of being the manager or the employee, forget it. And at the same time, you know, you go to visit your parents and their, you know, their generation and so forth. When you're with them, you're their child, you know. Then if you have children and you're with them, your child, children look at you, then you're the parent. Of course, when you go out of the room, even if they're little children and they're playing with one another, they forget parents and now they're with their peers and the role changes. They're no longer the, they're no longer the son or the daughter. They're the person relating to that other person in the sandbox. And we have all these roles, but who are we really? And you've had so many lifetimes of those roles. So to sit and meditate is to drop to the place of mindful awareness that says, yes, here is all these different changing roles. Who am I underneath this? Thomas Merton described looking for or seeing the secret beauty behind the eyes of each person, that spark that was born into this incarnation. He said, if only we could see each other that way, there'd be no more need for war or greed or cruelty. I suppose the big problem would be that we would fall down and worship each other. And when the Buddha taught these teachings, it was really radical at that time because India was and still remains, as is the U.S. and much of the world, filled with racism and tribalism and classism and so forth. And the caste system was really pretty horrific. If you were born as an untouchable, imagine, I mean, think about the worst of Jim Crow, the worst of the South um, uh, after the Civil War still, um, and then add to it, you know, it's not just separate drinking fountains or, or even lynchings, but if the shadow of an untouchable fell onto the food of or the well where a Brahmin or a high caste would drink, that person could be murdered for that. That your shadow would have polluted the water or the food. That's how intense the kind of social structure was. And the Buddha said, absolutely not. That who we are has nothing to do with race or caste or class or birth that if you seek nobility and dignity and liberation, it is only to be found in the heart of human beings. And for one who lives with integrity and generosity and wisdom and compassion, that I call a true Brahmin, a true holy person, a true noble person, and the rest is just social convention and folly. So when we begin to become mindful, it's as if we are asked to not only embody ourselves, come into the present, deal with what's here, but listen more deeply, who are you really? To ask this question. Because there's this paradox. You need to inhabit your body. You need to care for it, and we'll talk about that some. You need to feed it and clothe it and jog it and exercise it, you know, and all those things. It's, I mean, it's bizarre, but you do. You have to put dead plants and animals in this hole at one end and stuff them in regularly and chew them with the bones that hang down and glug them through the tube and all that. It's just what incarnation asks of you, right? You have to honor your incarnation and remember your social security number and your zip code. But you also have to remember that that's not who you really are. You also have to remember your true nature or your Buddha nature. Yes, you're a parent or a citizen or a student or a teacher, whatever your roles are. They're your roles. So in the story of the Buddha's awakening, 
he took his seat underneath the Bodhi tree, the tree of enlightenment, on the night of his enlightenment. And as his mind became clear and silent and collected and deep, he began this very deep inquiry into this same question, who am I really? He'd done all these yogic practices and all these... Basically, he'd had a lot of lives. He had the lives as a prince and the lives in the palace and then the lives as a, as a, a sadhu, as an ascetic yogi in India. And finally he was sitting there um, and as he got quiet in the myth or the story, it said he not only saw those lives within his physical lifetime that we all can remember of our own, but he saw hundreds of past lives. Now, you don't have to believe that. I mean, that's not necessary to believe at all. It might be true, so be careful when you die. Just pay attention. But, you know, it's not something that you have to believe because you've led so many lives. Different lives at different stages of your childhood and your teenage years, God spare you, and your, you know, and your um, educational years and your young adult years and all that. You've had all these lives. Each day is a new life. And he saw all these lives that he'd lived as you might look back, joyful lives and painful ones and days that were filled with frustration and, and anxiety and days that were filled with, filled with joy and attainment and celebration and days that are filled with, with uh, attachment. And, um, you know, it's like going to the movies, your own life, romantic days, right? Comedies, tragedies, adventure stories. You've had them too. But then the interesting thing happened on that night of enlightenment. After seeing all the different possibilities, and for the Buddha it also was remembering once I was born as an elephant or once I was born as a tiger, every possibility of of life. You've also been probably elephants and, you know, let's see, what's a stubborn animal? I think donkeys maybe, I don't know. Mules, you, I mean, you have all those in you, as Carl Sandburg said, there's a zoo in here, right? Um, but the, the, the compelling moment happened when the Buddha turned his attention to the profound question of, to whom does all this happen? And it's like you're sitting in the movies, and there's the romance, and there's the adventure movie, and there's the, you know, the the tragedy or the comedy or whatever happens to be, and you're really lost in the plot, and then all of a sudden, you know, somebody's eating popcorn next to you and coughs and sneezes, and and you kind of wake up out of that movie trance, and you go, oh, movie, right, there's the projector, there's the light, and all those little um, celluloid images, and you remember that it's the movie. And in some way, the Buddha turned his attention, as you can with mindfulness, from the content of all these different experiences to say, who is it that, it that is the witness to these experiences? What is this mystery of consciousness itself? What my teacher Ajahn Chah called chit um, or the original mind. Because he said all these different experiences come and they move the mind like the wind through the trees causing the leaves to flutter, pleasure and, and discomfort and Uh, possibilities and advertising and losses and gains and so forth, they cause the mind to flutter. But the original nature of the mind is pure knowing. And all these winds come through, they pass, and then they pass away. Look to see to whom these happen. And when we start to turn our attention to mindfulness itself, to the space of awareness, to rest in mindfulness and feel the breath and sensations and thoughts and feelings and the roles and perceptions and so forth, there comes an ease, a a lightening, an opening, a liberation. The Buddha puts it this way just to start with. He said, if you put a spoonful of salt in a cup, it tastes really salty. But if you take the same spoonful of salt and put it in the lake and drink the water, the water is still pure and clear. Make your mind vast like that. And then the things that come won't perturb you. This is one of the teachings. But it's more than that. Your mind in its true nature is vast. It is like space or the sky. 
and you don't have a mind in your head. I mean, that's the sort of conventional Western way we think of it. It's all stuffed in there somehow. <laughs> Actually, your body and your experience and so forth are in your mind, are in the mind, which is the space of consciousness itself or knowing. <clears throat> And as you pay attention and listen and feel, you sense, oh yeah, there's awareness and then there's the sights and sounds and thoughts like rivers that come and go. Now, to pay attention with deep mindfulness is called the invitation to the deathless, the release from limited identity, from the release from the body of fear. And I like to use this image I have very often recently. When you look in the mirror, you look older, right? But the weird thing is that you don't necessarily feel older, right? Even though it's sagging or losing its fur or got different, you know, wrinkles and blotches and stuff that happens. I'm sorry to say. Let's be honest about it here. Um, you look, but at the same time, there's that weird feeling of, oh, yeah, it's looking older, isn't it? That that's not who you are really. It doesn't take but a moment to look in the mirror, and there's some deep sense of knowing that this is the body that we've been given for this dance, for this incarnation, but it's not really who you are because the mind that sees in the mirror exists outside of time. The body exists in time it's born, and it goes through its stages, and it and eventually dies. But consciousness itself, the knowing, is timeless. and says, oh, wow, look at that. Amazing what's happening to it, isn't it? Look at how it's changing. And this knowing, which is transparent, timeless, unborn, undying, um, is the, is the, it is the space of freedom. It is the place of liberation. For us. It's why mindfulness is called the gateway to freedom. And you'll see, I mean, some people report this, and I wouldn't be surprised for you, even as you get ready to die, you might say, wow, you know, what an incarnation that was. There's some part of you, like my friend Salam, you know, or the man in the airport in Miami, that, that is the witness to all things says, this was really tough this year. That was a really rough year. That was the year of losing money or the divorce or illness. Or This was a fantastic year. But it's gone now also, isn't it? Where is it? And now the next thing comes. So this shift of identity um, means that who we take ourselves to be, the, the small sense of self, the body of fear, it's sometimes called, isn't really who we are. This, let me see if I can find this, a couple of passages here. This is from Ajahn Chah's teacher, Ajahn Man. Ajahn Chah, my teacher, went to see his master after having all these meditation experiences, and Ajahn Man looked at him and said, these experiences come and go. They're merely transitory states. Because you don't understand this point, you're always looking for something in your meditation as if that would satisfy your hunger. You take them to be real, to be the essence of mind. In fact, the happiness or sorrow, the thoughts and feelings that come, they're on a different level than the awareness itself, than the essence of mind. Turn to the essence of mind, see its nature, then you can stop, you can put things down. When the conditions, the changing conditions are seen for what they are, then you rest in the ultimate dimension, the unconditioned, you are free. Now here's another description. Remember what Kala Rinpoche said, when you understand you'll see that you're nothing, that you're not all these things, that they're the rivers that change that you're nothing and being nothing, you are everything. That is all. So I'm from Alice Walker. I like to read this. She said, one day when I was sitting quiet and feeling like a motherless child, which I was, it came to me that feeling of being part of everything, not separate at all, and I knew that if I cut a tree, my arm would bleed. 
and I laughed and I cried and I ran all around the house. I just knew what it was. In fact, when it happens, you can't miss it. And there is in us a deep knowing that we're not separate from the world, that the world is us, and that we're not even in the world, the world is in us. I mean, you can't, even that, the language doesn't work right. Awareness contains the world. And as, as we practice in this way, there comes a kind of emptying, not of experience, there's still sights and sounds and emotions and feelings and thoughts come and go, but the sense of self starts to dissolve and break apart. That identity, this is who I am. I have this role and I have these emotions and so forth. That's there. But they become more and more selfless, more and more transparent. Yes, it's here. And here is the space of awareness, the witnessing of it all. Empty and easy and gracious, as one of my teachers said. No self, no problem. (laughs) He just laughed a lot. No self, no problem. You know, the more you take it to be self, the more you'll suffer, the more you take it personally, basically. So here is Zhuang Tzu, like Lao Tzu, one of the great Taoist sages. He said, a drunken man who falls out of a cart, though he may suffer, does not die. His bones are the same as other people's, but he meets his accident in a different way. His spirit is in a condition of security. He's not conscious of riding in the cart, neither is he conscious of falling out of it. (laughs) The ideas of life, death, fear, and the like cannot penetrate his breast, and so he does not suffer from contact with objective existence. If such security is to be got from wine, how much more is to be found from resting in the Tao? (laughs) So as we get emptier, as we take things less personally, as we don't see, this is me and mine, my body, and I want it to be this way, does it listen? It kind of does what it, you take care of it, you rent it, but it doesn't do what you want. Don't get older. Stop sagging. You know, come on. Right? I'll do a lot of sit-ups. Maybe it'll help. It does help a little bit, but it gets older anyway. Okay, I don't want those emotions. Anybody succeed in stopping your emotions? You know, some medication maybe, I hope not, you know. And thoughts. And you start to see that this is the dance of life, but not so personal, not so much around I and self and all of that. And as the self gets emptier, not because it's not here, but it's more tentative and spacious and fluid because you learn to rest in mindfulness, things get easier. Now, There's one small little hitch to all this. It's time for Chuang Tzu to sober up a little bit. And this comes from a wonderful Tibetan text, Mahamudra. It says, With the release from clinging to body, feelings, thoughts, existence, the shining, luminous nature of mind is revealed. You rest in spacious awareness, as I've said, and now there is awakened in you as you rest in awareness, an exceeding compassion for all those that are still caught in the changing forms of the world. And you will offer your life for the liberation of these beings, even though your meditations have cleansed away any idea that such beings exist apart from yourself. So now we come to the paradoxical part. When I say it's time to sober up, the line from T.S. Eliot in... uh, in one of his great poems, I'm trying to remember which poem it's it's from, he writes um, anyway. He writes, "Teach us to care, and not to care. Teach us to sit still, even among these rocks. Teach us to care and not to care." Um, and what happens is that as you become more spacious, more trusting of mindfulness, to know experience without reacting and judging and, and being so lost in it. There's a kind of paradox because as you become more spacious, you also become more intimate with experience. And this is the second half of it. The first half of letting go of self, of finding spaciousness, of trusting mindfulness, then brings you back. Um, 
Because otherwise, meditation would be, you know, the accusations are it's navel-gazing, it's narcissistic, it uh, leads you to indifference. And it turns out that it's quite the opposite. That not only do you remember your Buddha nature, but you also do remember your zip code and you drive on the right side of the street, you know, because that's how other people are doing it and it would be a tragedy to do anything else and you stop at the red lights and you tend to that world that's around you which in some way becomes more mysterious and more precious because you're emptier and so you're able to see the light of the, of the sunset and taste the sections of the tangerine and notice the eyes of your lover or your, your child or, or the person, you know, that works in the cubicle next to you. Um, and somehow the emptying connects us with the world as deeply as it liberates us. Does this make sense to you, this paradox? And so as the identification, the grasping at things, the reacting to things, eases because mindfulness is this witnessing that allows things to be as they are without getting angry and judging and wanting them to be another way. It doesn't mean you can't tend or work for justice or, or, or care for the world, but you do it from a different place from a place that's spacious and loving and empty, rather than all agitated about it. As the emptiness grows, there is room for a natural compassion to open. Archbishop Tutu writes, in Africa, when you ask, when somebody asks how you are, the answer is always in the plural. You say, we are well or we are not well. A person, if you ask this person, they might be quite well, but her grandmother is not well. So she says, we are not well, because she is a part of, she's woven together with the fabric of that village or that community. And the whole notion of an isolated individual doesn't exist that way in traditional African understanding. You become compassionate not because, oh, I'm going to be this great compassionate person. A father of a two-year-old talks about turning on the television and unexpectedly seeing the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma some years ago. He watched as the firemen carried the limp and bloody bodies of toddlers, his own child's age, out of the ruins of the daycare center on the building's first floor. He said that in the past he was able to distance himself from other people's suffering, but since he's become a father, things have changed. He feels as if each of those children were his own child. He feels the grief of all parents as as his own grief. And somehow as we empty ourselves and open ourselves, there comes a connectedness with all of life. It's not just our pain, but it's the pain of humanity. It's not just our joy, but it's everyone's joy. And we're not so afraid of pain because it's part of life. Again, as... Elie Wiesel, the Nobel Prize winner, writes, Suffering confers neither privileges nor rights. It all depends on how you use it. If you use it to increase the anguish of yourself or others, you are degrading, even betraying it. And yet the day will come when we shall understand that suffering can also elevate human beings. God help us to bear our suffering well. And the spaciousness of mindfulness opens the heart. It turns out that mindfulness and love or mindfulness and compassion are really two sides of the very same state of consciousness because being nothing, you are everything. And it's your grandmother and it's your child and it's your rainforest and it's your oceans. And there comes attending not because, oh, I feel sorry for that poor left hand that got, you know, burned when I picked the pot up on the stove, maybe I should do something for it, you know. You don't think about it that way, do you? Oh, that poor hand, I wonder if I should do something. It hurts. And, you know, you put it in the cold water, you get the ice, you find what's necessary because there's a deep connection. And as you get, become more mindful and spacious and open, 
you become more connected in this amazing, open and beautiful way. So compassion grows. Generosity grows as well, which is one of the first pillars of the Buddha's path to happiness. Basically, do you know anybody who's really generous who isn't happy? Generosity means the capacity, the the joy of being able to be connected and share what we have because it's us. It's not them and me. It is us. Um, And it has gratitude and trust and joy in it. Um, I love reading this poem. I guess I will. Consider the generosity of the one-year-old who has no words to exchange with you yet and instead offers up her favorite drooled-on blanket, her green rhinoceros as big as she is, her cloth doll with the long pigtails, her battered, soggy cardboard books. And if you were outdoors with her, she would hand you a dead beetle, a fistful of grass, a pebble, by way of introduction, or just because. And if a moment later she wanted it back, it would be for the joy of the game that makes every simple object an offering. In the same way, sun drapes a buttered scarf across your face. Rose opens herself to your glance, and rain shares its divine melancholy. The whole world keeps whispering or shouting to you, nibbling your ear like a neglected lover. This is from Alison Luderman, a poem and a poet in Oakland, a wonderful poet. And somehow, as the sense of spaciousness grows in us, it becomes easy. Giving and receiving become just part of breathing in and out. And there isn't this tight holding. There's a sense that it's just us. You need something sure as best you can. And it doesn't mean you don't take care of yourself and, oh my God, I'm going to be codependent with the whole world now and everybody. (laughs) It doesn't mean that. This is wisdom. This isn't um, folly. It means that you know your place and your place starts to have more and more ease and graciousness and beauty in it. And you all know this. This isn't something news to you. New to you, it's not news. You know what this feels like. Compassion grows as you become emptier. Generosity grows. Embodiment comes. You know, there's the error of the spiritual bypass and the spiritual end run. I'm going to meditate and I won't have to deal with all that trauma from my childhood and all that, you know, difficulty in my relationship and the work thing and all that stuff. You know, I'll just do it all through meditation. I wish you well. (laughs) But it turns out it's not that way. That as emptiness grows, as it says in the Heart Sutra, form is emptiness. And you become less afraid of body and feelings and thoughts. Instead of being distant from, distant from them, there comes within this fathom-long body, the Buddha says, is all of the Dharma, is all of awakening. And there comes a, an attention to the intimacy of life itself. When there's illness, you love the body and try to bring healing to it with all the devotion and care that your heart can bring to it because it's precious and it's beautiful. And when there's success and happiness and dance, you also allow that. (laughs) Where are we? Yes. Life is not a journey to the grave to be arrived at in a beautiful and well-preserved body but rather to slide in broadside, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, loudly proclaim, wow, what a ride. (laughs) It's a different relationship to the body and to life itself. And it's not a detachment. Um, It takes the body as a sacred mirror for life itself. story for you. I have a few stories to read. This is from the novelist Ann Patchett during the first Gulf War. You remember way back to when we were fighting in the Middle East, right? (laughs) Oh my God. There's some delusion here, I think, you know. My Afghani 
taxi driver in San Diego said, nobody else didn't work in Afghanistan. What are you thinking, you Americans? Anyway, we'll leave that aside for the moment. So she writes... My problem with movies where people get killed is that my concentration is broken with the first death. I lack the mental dexterity required to simultaneously mourn and continue to follow the plot, and so I simply lose the plot. And it doesn't matter if it's the star or an extra shot in the crowd scene, I can never distinguish in my heart the difference. So I've fallen behind trying to figure out what's going on in in the Gulf War. I listen to the news but I'm not really following the movie because the bit players are starting to get knocked off. And when it gets down to one life, the mind achieves a vivid understanding. If I take the deaths one at a time, I notice that Marine Lance Corporal Michael E. Linderman of Douglas, Oregon was only 19. And I know, <coughs> and I know what it was like to be 19. And I notice that there wasn't a standard military portrait taken of Marine Private First Class Dion Stephenson of Bountiful, Utah. So they used his prom picture, and you can see the hook on the strap of his bow tie. And after you look at these pictures, the war becomes difficult to follow because to be decent, you have to stop and love them and mourn their passing, and there are getting to be so many of them, it's impossible not to fall behind. And you begin to feel the genuine tenderness that comes because you're available to life from this spaciousness. You sit in the morning, you sit in the evening in your meditation, and it really doesn't matter what happens. I'm quite serious about this. Sometimes you sit and you do reruns, and sometimes you sit, feel your breath. Sometimes what you notice are all the plans that you have to do in the day. But just the fact that you sit and Rest in awareness for some moments is stepping out of the drama of the movie and making space to witness this life from an open heart rather than just be caught and lost in it. And there comes then this capacity for deep connectedness, tenderness, and at the same time, a kind of inner liberation. Compassion, generosity, embodiment, also a trust I was reading the story of a young girl, who, 10-year-old, who was learning to horseback ride, and her father was there. And one of the horses, there were three or four girls riding in this trail in the woods on the way back to the, to the um, barn or the riding rink, got spooked somehow and started to run. And this girl's horse just took off. And, and the father and the riding instructor said, whoa, and so n- nothing. And the girl... The, was just hanging on to the neck of this horse as it was riding through the woods. And the father was terrified for his daughter because he really tried to protect her. But he said there she was hanging on to her horse's neck, you know, with her hair streaming behind and her eyes both fearful but also tremendously excited, you know, galloping. And finally he he rushes back to the barn um, and the horse is out outside without a rider on it and he's clear that she's fallen off and he's really worried and he goes in and and the instructor is already there and and she's saying how are you doing and she said well I hit my elbow and my knee did you hit your head no Um, how are you doing I'm okay and the instructor says well the thing to do before you go is to get back on that horse for your sake and the horse's sake and then his father looks and he says and all of a sudden I realized that my, my daughter would be safe, not safe. I mean, nobody's safe in this world. You're all going to die. But leaving that aside for a moment, <laughs> that big problem, that my daughter would be safe because she knew how to take care of herself. And she said, yep. And she went over to the horse and put her 10-year-old foot in the saddle and got back up on that horse. This from Lama Sakyong Mipam Rinpoche. He says... Where are we? Once I was, he's a great horseman. Once I was staying with friends in Colorado and I took one of my favorite horses, Rocky, on a trail ride through some back country. I'd ridden Rocky before, mostly in the arena. He was quite intelligent, but he didn't know how to walk a trail. This was a new situation and I was leading the group, which also made him nervous. I coaxed him over certain rocks and shifted my weight to indicate to him to go around certain others but he kept stumbling. 
We came to a narrow place in the trail. On one side was a steep shale cliff, and on the other a long drop into the river, 500 feet. Rocky stopped and waited for my direction. We both knew that one wrong move would plummet us into the river below. I guided him toward the gorge, subtly shifting my weight toward the high wall of shale. I thought that if he slipped, I could jump off and save myself. The moment I shifted, Rocky stopped cold and craned his head around to look at me. (laughs) He knew exactly what I was doing. I could tell that he was shocked and hurt that I was planning to abandon him. The look in his eye said, you and me together, right? (laughs) Seeing how terrified he was, I shifted my weight back. He swung his head forward in relief, and we negotiated the trail together with no problems. And this is really his instruction for sitting meditation, that you actually take your seat halfway between heaven and earth in this human form and say, yes, this is the dance. This is the tears and the grief and the tension that needs to be released in the body and the restlessness. And this is also the joy and beauty that comes. This is the spaciousness of I just take a few breaths and let go. This is the ease of the heart or compassion. And there grows in this a profound sense of trust. Trust that you can be present. Trust in the rightness of life itself. Not because there isn't tragedy and injustice and all of these things that we know that need to be tended in the world. But it's not your job to fix the entire world and kind of be atlas and take it on your shoulders. It's your job to bring an awakened heart and a a, a free and compassionate presence so that you can bring your gifts and your capacity to this earth because it needs somebody who's alive and present and centered in themselves. If we're, to, if we're to make any change, it really requires a change of consciousness at this time more than ever to know who we are and to know our connection. And so there comes this wonderful and profound sense of trust. The poet Rilke who writes, Being alive means not numbering or counting, but ripening, like a tree which doesn't force its stap, sap and stands confidently in the storms of winter, not afraid that summer may not come. It does come, it always comes. And in meditation and in our spiritual life, there grows a kind of trust in our capacity to blossom and change and transform and open no matter the vicissitudes of life. Because you will have praise and blame and gain and loss and pleasure and pain and fame and disrepute. It will happen to you. Anybody not have this? Keep asking the same question, really, don't I, huh? This is the way it goes. You will have. And that does not define you any more than for my friend Salam or Nelson Mandela to say that they can imprison my body, but they can't touch my spirit. And something in us knows this is true, and there comes a trust more and more that you can be with the fullness of your experience, with the depth of sorrows and with the great joy. And so joy starts to come. And it's not the joy that denies the sufferings of life, but it's the joy that comes from the liberated heart. The Buddha's instructions are live in joy even amidst the troubled. Live in joy and health even among those who are sick. Live in joy and well-being in this world through all its changes. He doesn't say be sorrowful and and, 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 and get caught in all of that. He said there's a, you see it in the Dalai Lama, this tremendous well-being and joy. And so what happens is you get quieter, and by quieter it doesn't mean that things stop, but there's a spaciousness and openness of resting in awareness. It gets more playful. You get more playful. In 1969, right out of graduate school, I was drafted in the U.S. Army. After I got new clothing, a haircut, and vaccinations, I filled out a stack of forms. One asked for my religion. Feeling rebellious, 
I decided to choose a new religion for myself. I wrote Druid, parentheses, reform, close parentheses. <laughs> Two weeks later, I received my dog tag stamp with my name, social security number, blood type, and Druid reformed. I wondered how the army would administer last rites for that. I have to apologize because I read this recently here, but some of you fortunately weren't here and you're still laughing. Station stateside, several months later, I was looking forward to a big night out when the commandant, commanding officer canceled all weekend passes. A large anti-war post was, protest was scheduled. He was afraid a lot of his soldiers would attend. <laughs> but I was determined to go camping with my girl. Discovering there was a full moon that particular weekend, I requested a two-day pass to celebrate a religious holiday. <laughs> The commanding officer was skeptical. What the hell religion are you? I told him I was a druid. And the last full moon before winter solstice was our high holy day. He demanded to see my dog tags, so I showed them to him. He looked at them in stunned silence for a moment, then granted me the pass. As I was on my way out, he said, Wait a second, don't you guys kill goats? No, sir, I said, that's the orthodox. I'm reformed. (laughs) There comes playfulness, flexibility, joy, ease, uh, and a kind of freedom. I remember, um, and I like to tell this story on daylongs, going into a health food store in Santa Cruz in... 1974, 75, a long time ago. And there was a poster of Swami Satchitananda. It was this wonderful Indian guru with a long flowing beard and hair and so forth. But anyway, he was um, wearing just a little orange loincloth and he was standing in the tree pose, something more or less like this. But, you know, um, the thing is that he was balanced on a surfboard on a really big wave, you know. <laughs> And it said underneath, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. Meditate with Swami Satchitananda or something like that. It was an advertisement, basically. There is a kind of flexibility and ease that comes as we rest in awareness, as we trust the space of mindfulness, as we practice and train. The training allows us to inhabit and open to and remember who we really are. And this kind of freedom, the Buddha called it the sure heart's release, is your birthright. O nobly born, begin the Buddhist text, remember who you really are. Shift from the small sense of self, from the body of fear, to your own original or true nature. Viktor Frankl, who wrote when he walked out of the concentration camps. He said, we who live in the concentration camps can remember those who walk through the huts comforting others and giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but their very existence proves the greatest and final freedom for human beings, the freedom to choose your spirit in any given circumstance. So the invitation of meditation in some pragmatic and simple way is to quiet the mind, be in touch with your breath, release the tensions of your body, learn how to regulate the emotions of anxiety and fear and longing and love and so forth, how to see all the play of the mind without being so lost in judgment and self-criticism and so forth, how to be more forgiving. But that's the opening gambit. With that is the invitation to the space of awareness itself, timeless and free, liberated. And this is possible for you and not someplace far away in the Himalayas or, you know, at the end of some long retreat. It is available anytime, any place you are, anytime you sit down, anytime you bring attention and say, ah, yes, awareness instead of what's on the movie screen and begin to relax into it and trust it. Flexibility, graciousness, compassion, generosity, they all come naturally from this practice. Mm -hmm.